can i start yes go yeah thank you saurabh thank you for the go ahead and uh, good afternoon everyone and uh, welcome to another webinar by the destination knowledge center uh, today we are doing museums of delhi part 1 uh, it's a part of our delhi series and today we are going to uh, cover this six places the national museum the national gallery of modern art the craft museum the sanskriti museums the ghalib museum in old delhi and uh, then we are going to move to the streets of delhi uh, which is the open air museum and uh, to take us on this journey we have with us today seema srivastav welcome seema and thank you so much Hi. for your time thank uh, you seema is an art historian culture theorist teacher and a designer uh, her interest with the world of art spans more than two decades she is qualified with a bachelor of fine arts from the university of delhi and an ma and mphil from the national museum institute new delhi uh, in a passion to impart knowledge and curate unique cultural experiences for connoisseurs seema conducts museum visits heritage and art walks and craft experiences in collaboration with and for prime travel companies over to you seema thank you so much kuntil and good afternoon everyone uh, it's wonderful to be invited back uh, here and uh, today what we have is a very very interesting uh, topic uh, museums and as you know most of you while planning itineraries for our visitors uh, you know sometimes definitely include a museum or two but i don't know how many of you uh, did visit a museum while you were young or as you grew old and well i remember there was a time when i used to find museums very boring and you know if my dad said let's go to a museum and i said oh god that's so boring and i think uh, in time the whole concept of museums has changed so let me take you through just let's try and explore what museums are all about i'm sure most of you know but let's just try to see how there's been a transition or a change not only in the definition the functioning and running of a museum and how it has uh, brought about a great change in the experiences of people who travel to these museums and then of course uh, we are in the capital and why not start with delhi and that's the plan so moving on to the first question what is museum so uh, what you see in front of you are two images of two buildings and national museum and of course on the right is a favorite of mine pratap singh museum in shrinagar and the old meaning of museum a building in which object of interest or significance are stored or exhibited now what is interesting is that uh, the oldest uh, definition yeah we could go to the next please yeah so what is a museum and museum is of course this is the definition being a non profit making and a permanent institution in the service of society and development uh, and open to the uh, you know uh, okay to the public which acquires conserves researches okay it's a crazy kind of a definition and not my cup of tea but this was actually the definition given by the indian Co international council of museums in 1947 when people didn't know what these spaces were all about so next please ah that's more like you feel oh yes when we go inside a museum there are going to be these glass cases and i remember you know my grandfather he used to give me a great definition of a museum he always said they are wonder rooms with cabinets of curiosity and i think that is why there was a word which we use called ajayab ghar i don't know if any of you have read stories which have related to museums or old documentaries it used to be an interesting place of intrigue where people went to see a fossil a skeleton or some kind of uh, interesting objects from the past and this concept of ajayab ghar stayed on for a while and most museums were sort of places uh, of this kind next please where people went to see a fossil a skeleton or some kind of interesting object so okay today we celebrate museums and they can be different kinds of museums they can be museums for children and adults local and national 
specialized and universal. Now, this is a very interesting statement. We never thought that we would see such a diversity. And in the next few slides, I'll really explain to you how we talk about this. Next, please. Yes, this is something the new museum age is upon us. Of course, it's a new museum uh, age. There are no definitions now for a museum. Museum spaces can be used in such different ways. And today's select of six museums will sort of uh, prove what I'm saying. Next, please. Yes, why do we go to a museum? I wish I could have actually asked you to tell me why you went to a museum. Um, a lot of people said, a museum is a place which has a sofa where you can sleep on. Okay, uh, a museum is an air conditioned space which is great to keep yourself away from the heat. Uh, of course, uh, a museum is a kind of a wormhole where you don't look for a destination. You can keep moving in and it's like a kind of an ecstasy machine where you lose one's head. And I like that. A museum is a place to go crazy. But even it's also a place which will make you a totally different person. Let's go to the next. Ah, fun and day out. I'm sure many of you or uh, you know your families find it intriguing to just have a fun day out at a museum. I don't know how many of you are frowning on that, but uh, a long time, as I told you, I used to be like that. But today there are so many amazing options and uh, it's also become a very important part of uh, you know, outreach programs for kids or for adults or for anybody, any age. So it's a place for education. It's a place for entertainment. There can be events in a museum. That's a new thing which came up only in the last decade or so when there were many, many interesting events that were happening. This whole thing of being in a museum is very interesting because it's experiential. You go through not only viewing an object or an event, but there's a perception and there's a big change in your own approach to life, to people around you, to society itself. It gives you a sense of place. Of course, things of you know, 5,000 years ago suddenly have a kind of a place and a time fixed when you enter into a museum. A great place for social and cultural activities, interactive place, and finally, and most important, wonder and intrigue. Next, please. Okay. I have always, uh, you know, wanted to, uh, uh, I have gone to museums only because I wanted to see the building. That's interesting. Architecture and location. So many times the whole experience of a museum changes when you are in a particular kind of a location or you're in a particular kind of space or the building is so that, you know, either you're looking up to a very high building or you're, there is no building. Okay, there is no building. And that is one of the reasons uh, museums become important is how they are sort of located or designed. The second, of course, becomes collections. You can have a very small, but a very intriguing collection. You know, I was once in the, uh, in the hills at, in, uh, uh, near Manali and I went to see a museum and I entered. This room was as small as my bathroom and it had only about 10 pieces of artifacts, but so beautifully displayed. They were curated, they were documented, and they gave me an, another slice of life into the village people around that community. And the last, of course, things could consider our audience and community. And this is really important. If you are bored in a museum, someone said, then you're doing it wrong. This whole thing of the audience and involvement in a museum becomes highly important. Next, please. Okay. Now, you know, here I've got a picture of the Museum of Kites, Ahmedabad. I'm sure many of you know the connection of kite flying in Ahmedabad. And having a Museum of Kites, God, kites are something, you know, we just buy from the corner store just before 15th August or Sankranti and then rush to our terraces, don't we? No, but every object in this world has a history. And as people's interest in knowing more about themselves came, or the intrigue came in things which were changing every day. There were people and communities which decided to actually uh, sort of become 
uh, custodians of putting these things as a collection and curated with time, with a chronology, and also showing us changes in methods and materials. The first few kites were not made with the same paper as they are today. And today, in fact, the contemporary kites are coming out of materials which didn't even exist in the past. So that's a very intriguing kind of a museum, which would be definitely quite uh, exciting to visit. Next, please. I just mentioned architecture. Oh, to the Museum of Man no building. You're in a space and you're not only in a space, you're transported back into time when man lived thousands of years ago or hundreds of years ago and becoming an experience. Visit to the Museum of Mankind in Bhopal is no way a visit to a conventional museum. You're there and at some time you might even feel you're part of it. Was, isn't that exciting? Next please. That's how it looks. And I remember going there and sitting for a long time. And actually my um, kind of uh, imagination started traveling as if I was in that old time space and I lived over here and there are no fans and no air conditioning. And we live in these kind of hay capped uh, little huts. How would life be? So it's not only about education. There's so much of a kind of uh, understanding and respect for cultures or of the past. Next, please. Ah, okay. This is a, a very favorite picture taken a few years ago when I actually waited for about three to four hours in a queue at the Palace of Versailles. And uh, the interesting part was that the wait was, of course, not for any special collection. This is the scene every day over there. And I wondered, when will I see such cues at the National Museum? When will I see such cues in, uh, in my museums here? And I think this uh, kind of question came into my mind. What is it about museums to actually excite people to come there? The outreach to get more people there. And this is a common thing if you're traveling anywhere outside India. But I'm not that disappointed now the awareness towards Indian museums is definitely growing day by day. And I do see a lot of people making plans to go to see a museum. Next, please. Yeah, some more of these crazy cues. No, they're not going for a political, uh, you know, kind of a, a march. No, nothing of that sort. Not for the fashion shops. These are all museum lines and people stand for hours. Now look how interesting it is. Look at the excitement and curiosity people have. So no museum is complete without its audiences. The, it's a hand in glove kind of a situation. A museum might be there, but if an audience is not there, the museum has no role to play. Next, please. Okay, I'm sure you know the Louvre, same situation. Next, please. Okay. Wow. And that's Delhi's National Museum. No, no, no. I am not trying to tell you that I'm not criticizing it at all. It has one of the best collections. But I'm, this was the situation just about 15 years ago, 12 years ago. A lot has changed in the last 10 years with the UNESCO reaffirming people's faith in museums, reasserting how museums have to be changed to make a great place of enjoyment or education experiences and our understanding of our own lives. So this is of course, just a slide to show you the same. Next please. So this is a very important slide and I think it will be very relevant to most of my viewers today and the listeners today and the concept of why am I discussing museums? All of us in the travel trade know when we are making itineraries, we realize that a lot of our guests are asking, are there any museums which we can visit? Are there any collections which are unique to your country? Are there any sites which have connected museums where we can get to see the collections which might have been at that site, which will give us a broader understanding? And that's where I feel that uh, cultural and heritage tourism has become 
you know, has a very, very major role to play now. And it's connect to museums in the sense for economic uh, growth, plus, of course, the whole showcasing of our culture and heritage becomes important. So a lot of our travel directed uh, projects are based with a couple of museums. For instance, you go to Varanasi and you go to Sarnath. Sarnath, the site never feels complete unless we go to the local museum there. Uh, the same could be at many other places, which are generally the uh, little museums run by Archaeological Survey of India. As you know that we have more than 1000 museums in our country with more than about 90% museums owned by the government or the archaeological survey, only 10% are privately owned. And out of that, about 40% are actual locations near archaeological sites or monuments. And I think that is why museums again become important as being the section two of understanding the monument and the history itself. Next, please. Okay. Uh, I'm sure many of you have guessed what is this? And uh, it's interesting to tell you that uh, the first museum in the world was set up in 2500, well, sorry, 2500 years ago in Babylon. And that was in fact, just a kind of a place where, you know, elite and the rich people used to showcase their collections. But this is India's first museum, which was opened in 1814 in Calcutta, which is now Kolkata, called the Imperial Museum Calcutta. Today, of course, it's called the Indian Museum. Interestingly, it was set up by a Danish. I'm sure many of you know that it was not only the British who were here, uh, there were Danish colonies and the Dutch colonies. And in Serampur, which is not very far from the city of Calcutta, there was a, a Danish settlement and a man called Nathanel Wallich. He was actually an artist who used to draw a lot of these plants and things as part of his surveying of Indian lands of what grows here, what is the kind of flora and fauna, started uh, with the collection of his own flora fauna drawings and samples which were brought over here. Of course, Indian Museum of Calcutta, the building itself is so amazing. And in the last 10 years, it's gone through a big revamping. Thanks to UNESCO and the government funding them to make it a very, very exciting place because the collections over here are amazingly rare. So, of course, Calcutta, again, if you have a group traveling to Calcutta, I don't think a trip of Indian Museum can be left out. Next, please. Ah, now this, of course, is where we really start. Uh, Kuntil already mentioned today we are discussing Museums of Delhi. I'm sorry it took a little extra time to give you an introduction, but I think that was essential. And today I have decided to take six museums, the National Museum, uh, which was actually my second home, as it's not only a museum today, it is also an institute, which is a deemed university. And that's where I spend many years of my life, not only studying, but then teaching. And I tell you, why I'm telling you this is the most exciting part was that whenever I had to teach something on Indian art, I would just take people or my students down to the galleries. What fun. You don't have to put projectors and slides. Just take them and let them see. And thankfully, at times, I even got them to touch the artifacts. Some power of being a faculty there. But and the second, of course, the National Gallery of Modern Art. Uh, it's such a pride when we go there and we see that India moved along with the global changes in art and design and with the influence of many movements on the Western world and the independent thinking of the new artists, there came a new wave in art, new styles, new techniques, new methodology. And so the National Gallery of Modern Art becomes very relevant. Uh, the third is the Craft Museum, which I'll talk about. Sanskriti Museum. Sanskriti, again, an interesting term. And then, of course, to Ghalib. I'm sure most of you know of Mirza Ghalib. And finally, the museum, which is the Street Museum. Next, please. A building I'm sure you've seen many a times if you've crossed on Janpat, uh, traditionally called Queensway. Um, and I must tell you, when it was Queensway, that's the time this museum was inaugurated. It's very interesting that it was in the 1947, 48 period that an exhibition was held in England at the Burlington House of collections of what the British 
claimed to be their best collections from their travels to India. It was so much welcome that they held the same exhibition at the Rashpati Bhavan on return. And then they said, why is it that only you know, VIPs or dignitaries should see this? It should be open for public. And that's when in 1949, 15th of August, the Governor General of India, Raja Gopalachari, actually inaugurated this museum. Next, please. Oh, I think we can go to the next. Ah, you know, it's a pleasure. You don't have to know about all the history. You don't have to know about all the periods. A museum is a place which completely gets you involved. Just look at this beautiful image of Surya, the sun god. And exactly, isn't it like starting your day, you draw open the curtains and you see the sun rays. You enter into the museum and you completely uh, welcomed by this beautiful smiling face of the sun god. Yes, of course. Thankfully, you can get your audio guides. You can get your personal guides. And I have... Uh, had such wonderful experiences with lots of people from all over the world who have just stood here and said, we don't feel like going ahead. This one um, sculpture has completely left us mesmerized. Now, this is what it's all about. Museums can be a place, not necessarily that you need people. You just need your good pair of eyes and you just need to be right there and you'll enjoy it. National Museum has one of the massive collections and a very, very great collection, right from sculptures to manuscripts to paintings. So let me take you through a little walkthrough, quick walkthrough to through some of the sections. Next, please. Ah, I had to get a close-up. For those who haven't seen it, just go. And this is intriguing, done thousands of years ago. And just look what the way the silpin or the craftsman carved the body, a reflection of that perfect image iconographically and that lovely smile and all the details. Isn't it a pleasure? Next, please. One of the most treasured collection of National Museum. I'm so proud of it. Uh, something to be proud of all over the world. The Indus Valley Collection. It's so selective. It is such a wonderful collection of the times when which make our civilization the oldest in the world and beautifully curated, beautifully displayed. And you can walk or sit through these galleries, you know, and I've seen so many children and students just sitting and painting over there. I had some guests from South America who used to brag a lot about their own culture. And when they came here and they said, Oh, wow. I wish we could take this collection back to our country. Next, please. A very nice example. It has to be a place you can't take for granted. Museums have collections. This is actually done in the lost vast process. It is metal casting done in those times. Of times. And these are large pieces. I hope these slides will also give you a kind of a, a interest to visit as, as soon as the lockdown is over. Uh, next, please. We're getting what? We're getting a reflection of society, how people lived, what kind of modes of transport, how did they do agriculture, how did they survive? So museums are such sort of an, you know, a window opening into another culture. It's like looking through your neighbor's window. And that's what I've always felt. Next, please. Next. The great iconic dancing girl, uh, which has now reached every coffee table book, if they're talking about Indian civilization or every textbook. And this is a part of the collection which makes museum, National Museum, very, very important. Next, please. Museums have to be updated. Uh, can we go to the next so that you can get a closer look? Okay. The famous bronzes, the Chola bronzes from South India. This gallery has been around for years and years, but just about three years ago, this particular gallery was revamped. Um, not that I didn't mind the collection even three years before, but suddenly 
this seems to be the favorite with all. Yes, the air conditioning definitely works better, but more than that, a beautiful display and you'll see it in the next few slides. Next, please. They're nicely well curated, well kept in clean glass cases. And they're so, uh, the, the, you know, the whole walk through into this gallery is one of the most spectacular experiences. And 90% of my guests who have traveled from abroad have said that they've seen a lot of museums in India. This gallery per se is one of the finest. Today, of course, I'm not talking particularly about any particular collection, uh, but today is just a day to take you through a walk. Next, please. Lovable ones. You know, a lot of my guests come and say, you know, you've got how many million gods do you have? And then I said, many million gods, okay. Um, how do you know which god is what? I said, well, because I know it from childhood. I've heard stories. I know about uh, the events that happened, whether it was uh, Krishna with Kalia or Ganesha. But this is where it becomes a wonderful lecture. I have walked with people. I have explained to them. And just looking at these amazing images, they seem to understand our Indian mythology uh, pretty well. At least it's a, like the first uh, kind of a... Uh, uh, you could say a dummies book and then they can go on to reading lists and find out more. But that's what is so great about this collection. Next, please. Uh, of course, there's so many. I've got a bit biased because this is one of my favorite sections, but I can tell Kuntil to please move on. Uh, I have a, so much to cover today. Ah, Terracotta, clay. Can clay be carved? Of course, this is stone. This beautiful Buddha, Gupta period. Again, historically very well curated, it's labeled, but you understand how art has gone through such changes. This is a collection to be revered. You can just sit here. You know, National Museum in Delhi is one of the only places uh, where they actually have a relic of Buddha, Buddha's time. And it is like a temple, it's a worship area. And that is very intriguing. Guests from Southeast Asia, or you know, Japan and China have made it an F they have made efforts to actually say that we want to do our pilgrimage to National Museum. Next, please. Absolutely amazing. Just look at the carving. Was were Indian women like this? Yeah, they must have been. Modern period. Imagine carving clay and bringing out that beautiful feminine beauty. And this is mind you only one museum. We have thousand museums in India. So the amount we can see. Next, please. Ganga and Jamuna, the two rivers personified in some two of the terracottas, which are one of the largest. They're more than human size. Uh, and so this uh, great intrigue in methods and materials. Next, please. Okay, miniature paintings. National Museum brags of one of the best collections. Well curated, well documented, well preserved, well conserved. Beautiful lighting, just perfect. And this is one of the examples of the uh, miniature painting in the miniature section, which is a must-see. So two galleries I recommend, even if you're planning a program for any of your visitors in National Museum, it has to be, you know, you can't spend the whole day there, but Bronze Gallery, Harappan Gallery, and miniatures are must-see, must-see, must-see. Next, please. Different styles different genres or schools, whether it is Pahari or Rajasthani or Mughal miniatures. Next, please. Next. Ah, a very rare ivory collection. Okay, of course, it'll only be in museums. We don't have ivory anymore here. Yeah. But yes, just to again appreciate the quality of carving. Museums are a place which teach you to appreciate art. They teach you of understanding things with the finer nuances. So that is again a reason of going to museums. Next, please. A collection that opens only once a year. So if you're lucky and if you have the dates right, you can see the Nizam's jewelry. Oh, I've stood with a lot of women. I had a group from Brazil and of course one from uh, South Carolina who said, we love jewelry. And I said, you're in for a great surprise. 
the Nizam's jewelries are on a display and they couldn't believe the craftsmanship, the beauty and the kind of reflection of that opulent lifestyle of these Nizams. Next, please. Coins, numismatic, again, a great collection. What a wonderful way of understanding people, their economic lives, the importance of their own heritages through calligraphy and portraiture on coins and pendants, all right there at the National Museum. Next, please. Okay. So from National Museum, we go on to the other part of Sher Shah Suri Marg, or just next to India Gate, is a museum which, again, very, very uh, much on the international scene, known for a great collection, uh, a timeless collection, really, and that is the National Gallery of Modern Art. Modern, of course, a term which came with art, which really developed uh, with a very new kind of style, breaking away from the canons of the old traditional styles. Next, please. Yes, everyone in the West might have heard of Frida Kahlo, but if we want the equivalent of Frida Kahlo, it's Amrita Shergill. And about 90% of her collection, her works are right here at National Gallery of Modern Art. I've had visitors who've told me, it's on our bucket list, we would like to see who is this Amrita Shergill called the Frida Kahlo of India? I said, well, she is just Amrita Shergill. And yes, National Gallery is the place to go and see her collections, showing her dependence on her Western training and her Indian kind of um, sensitivity. Next, please. Yes, we can go through these. They're so beautiful. Look at her. She talks to us. Look at her. She seems to be talking to the spectator. Viewers can stand and just have a tete a tete of their own. Next, please. Again, I have a bias. So lots of slides on Amrita, of course. Next, please. Definitely a change from miniatures. So I hope you understand. There is a museum for everything, an object, an art piece, a style, a person, his life or her life her identity, whatever. Next. Okay. Oh, no, no, it's not child's drawing. The famous Jamini Roy. These are the people who sort of started the whole Bengal school. And then there's this whole history of graphic design coming in here. People like designers and architects, illustrators have loved this part of the galleries where they see this not only as a beautiful design, but then when I tell them, do you know it is symbolic of the British holding on to the Indian soil, the stranglehold of the British? They said, oh, wow, we never thought like that. So the symbolism, the modern movements, which in the West had started affecting the movements in India. Next, please. Next. Yeah, we can sort of just walk through these quickly so that we can see more design, color, radiant, uh, Indianness, Ramachandran, bringing out the beautiful images of his folk tales and of his roots. Next, please. Or modern works, really modern. Arpana Kaur, uh, influence of partition on her life. Next, please. Tayad Mehta, abstraction, expressionism. Uh, more graphic and also telling the world that yes, he's the artist who went on the world map on the world scenario of getting the highest price at the Sotheby's auctions. Next, please. Some more. Ah, how can we go to National Gallery of Modern Art and not think of other kind of aspects of art, whether it was sculpture, or you know, murals. This is an installation. And here we have what is called really a sculpture, but an installation called Dada. Now it's interesting, Dada was a Dadaism was a movement in the West. And Subodh Gupta, of course, completely enamored by the tree of life, with his wonderful influence of his life uh, at home, his mother's pots and pans and simple life of the domestic scene being sort of created over here as um. Uh, beautiful conceptual 
uh, artwork called Dada, but shows the tree of life, food, pots and pans, which help to nurture us. A beautiful piece. Even if you're driving around, this is visible. It's a great piece to show off. I love taking my visitors here. It's like the final kind of showstopper at National Gallery of Modern Art. Next, please. Yes, imagine this is a museum. You know, the first time I went, I thought I was going into a village. And it makes sense. It, of course, makes sense. Uh, let's go to the next, then we know the name. I'm sure everybody does. The Craft Museum. Uh, of course, today it has a longer name. It's called National Craft Museum and Hastakala Academy. Uh, set up in 1956 by two amazing women who were responsible, Pupul Jaikar and Kamla Devi Chattopadhyay, who said if, you know, uh, the thirsty can't go to the well, let's get the well to the thirsty. If we can't go and actually appreciate our villages and the craftsmen and the beautiful kind of indigenous and vernacular architecture and see how people till today live in these villages with this kind of celebration of rich and diverse craft traditions. Let's bring a craft museum here. So when you're in here, you don't even feel, next please, you don't even feel you're in a museum because everything just looks as if you're walking through a village. You might be walking in a village in Kerala or suddenly you're walking through a Jharokas of Rajasthan. Or you are looking at this huge Uruli and thinking, oh, in Kerala, are they going to be having a community feast and making a kind of a rice pudding in it for the whole village? So it's very interesting. Uh, again, a kind of, I would say, a feather in the cap of Delhi museums. Oh, wow. You know, you could just spend the whole day here, isn't it? No building, no museum building. They have just brought the village here. So you're actually getting an experience. It's experiential. And it's not only that experience comes through seeing buildings. Let's go to the next. We'll see what else. Ah, celebration of birth, celebration of a marriage. They've actually done the wall paintings. So craft museum basically gets divided into two or three sections. The village homes, of course, the village walls, and the way they are painted, done in the traditional style, using the traditional methods. Next, please. Uh, images and icons in terracotta and clay, which are part, the integral part of the lives of these villagers, whose whole security of life and death are dependent on idols and images of these kinds or many more. Some are, of course, aspects of guardian figures, while some are for celebration of rain or whatever. I mean, all kinds of things come alive over here. Next, please. A whole, oh, absolutely brilliant collection of these uh, uh, jackfruit wood sculptures, which take you into another world of magic and takes you into a kind of a world of mysticism. It takes you into this interesting kind of tantric cults again part of the life of a lot of people and this is represented in this special gallery over here next please absolutely stunning terracotta utility you could even light a lamp in it and yet they could be used for reverence oh how interesting is that understanding craft in totality next please Wall paintings. Wall paintings have been part of so many collections. And here they actually got the best artists, next please, to do these on the walls. Whatever you see here are being done by actual people who in their own villages are either doing it even today, practicing artists. They have been given some kind of a platform or podium by the Ministry of Textile or the Craft Museum to come and do it here, display it. And some of them are even national award winners. And many a times you get to meet them there. Next. Different parts of the country. And imagine you're getting to see it all here. It's like a little textbook on craft. Just opens up there when you go to Craft Museum. Next. Okay, are we in Rajasthan? Yes, of course, traditions. And it's interesting how your eyes just go through and some of you say, oh yes, of course we saw this in Jaipur or we saw this in Udaipur or we saw this in 
Charkhand or wherever. And that is amazing. Can you look at the blocks of stones? Yes, you can actually sit there for hours and just gaze in that natural surrounding uh, with the trees and the beautiful sun on a winter morning. It is just fabulous. Next, please. How privileged we are. We can actually meet the craftsmen. Every month, a certain number of craftsmen or artisans or artists are invited here and they become resource materials for us. And this is the place, of course, I find it very interesting to tell my guests, you know, you can take a part of the museum. This is a government place. You can actually shop here. They've actually got a museum where you can take an artist's work. Oh, that is quite intriguing for them. Next, please. So again, the displays of different kinds of things. Ah, museums are also places for events. What would it be if you just sat there and suddenly, you know, your feet start tapping? I've actually danced with these people many a time without knowing what the how, but just listening to the beat, that is what museums are today. The new wave museums experience enjoy it, understand the culture. We don't have anything like this. Do we wear masks like this? But there are people who still today do these kind of performances as part of their life existence. Next, please. Beautiful. Next. Ah, you know, a day at the museum, fun, frolic, khana pina bhi hona chahiye. And why I'm only showing you one of these is that uh, the craft museum decided that if they were going to expose you to all kinds of different craft traditions from the country, it would be great to even savor the different kinds of foods from different regions. So the Cafe Lota at Craft Museum is a place uh, which has been enjoyed by many and getting a good diversity of flavors from all over the country. So I just included this. Next, please. Ah. Ah, it's not always that the government sets up things. There are individuals whose interest in museums or collections, or even their interest becomes starts when they sit at home and see their kitchen and they see the beautiful collection of pots and pans in their own house. A man named Mr. O.P. Jain, was intrigued as a child when he was living in old Delhi with the kind of beautiful pots and pans his mother had. And one day she called the scrap guy, the kabadi wala and said, well, I don't need these and you can, I'll get rid of these. He was a young boy and he told his mom, why are you getting rid of these? These are beautiful. And that's where he, as a teenager, started his own collection. When he was older and when he was comfortably placed, when he could actually set up a foundation and he actually set up a place which was to cultivate an environment for preservation and development of artistic activities. That is what Sanskriti means. And this is why the Sanskriti Museum in this experience to actually add or make you a little more value added or cultivate that interest in everyday life objects. Next, please. Oh, a simple thing like a pot. One of the first things a man would have made once he would have found clay so that he could store water, grains, or even the ashes of the dead in some countries. So terracotta, a museum of terracotta. Every object has a history. Next, please. And yes, a space for events. You know, I have spent a whole day here. I tell all the people who are listening to me today or watching this, please take out time and just go there and sit down and have a cup of chai one of the best experiences of being right in the middle of nature and looking at everyday objects all around you. A very popular with a lot of foreigners, I must say so. Next, please. Beautiful. Next. Museums are not only about putting and dumping in collections. They have to be put properly. Their display is important. There's to be an aesthetics in that which you can see right here. Next, please. Everyday object. I'm sure if you had a temple at home, there would be a bell. You go to a temple, many a time one hangs outside like a bell to ring for the door. He, this is our, all his own collections, which he picked up 
and gradually developed it into this museum. Next, please. Uh, next. Ah, textiles. I'm sure many of you know. India has been, we are very blessed with so many beautiful individuals who have taken a lot of effort of collecting pieces, whether you go to the Calico Museum in Ahmedabad or even at the Craft Museum, which has a collection. But this one is mind blowing. Mr. Jain's collection is small. And you know, it's very important, as I just mentioned earlier also, you might have a small collection and no good people, the collection doesn't matter. It might be a very big, great collection and gets missed. This is a very modest collection of just a handful of absolutely beautiful pieces, how well they've been preserved, they've been documented. And this is a lover, a treat for a lover of fabrics and textile. Uh, sometime back I had, uh, uh, this I must share with you, was the designer who designed the clothes for the musical Hamilton, which is being talked about for quite some time. When she came in over here, she said, God, I have never seen fabrics like this. And right now she's working on this inspiration in one of her lines for the next musical. Next, please. So from Pichwai, uh, Pichwais, which are also fabrics, but of course not here, but Patolas to uh, Banarsis to Bandini to, uh, all kinds of techniques and different kind of Ryan pets, petani, everything seen with its most exquisite examples. Next, please. Just look how beautiful and yet giving us a great reflection of the styles and many of them are present today. We are still continuing this. This is a legacy, of course, and I, I hope these museums teach us to value it and keep it alive. Next, please. Everyday objects, even from a pen, pen to an ink pot, to a little idli maker. Oh, this is, you know, I have a childlike craziness when I go here. As I said, museums can make you, your head go crazy. I feel like I could open these and start playing with them. They remind me of my childhood when I used to have these little sets of pots and pans to play with. And they're so beautifully kept here. And again, you suddenly realize, you know, once I visited this museum and I came home and I looked for this little beetle box, a panka dabba, which belonged to my grandmother and was kept inside and I took it out and suddenly it connected that person to me. It connected the history of pan and the eating of pan in my house. And it connected me to a legacy. And I think that's what happens when you come to a museum like this. Next, please. Next. Look at the space. It doesn't have to look like one of those large daunting places where you feel, oh God, how am I going to walk? This is so cool. You remove your shoes here, but it's nice fun. It feels as if you're just walking inside a house. You're walking in a home which was set up years ago with all these traditional things there as part of everyday life. Next, please. Ah, this is very interesting. If I had to talk about the smallest museum of the world, it would be here. Travel all the way to Old Delhi to the Gali Qasim John in. Uh, and that is where you find this beautiful Mirza Ghalib's museum. It is one of the smallest museums, but it's also interesting because this was his home. Mirza Ghalib or Mirza Asadullah Khan, as he was known, uh, Urdu poet of the 18th century. And this is the Ghalib Ki Haveli. I still thank those people who not only discovered it lying in a very bad shape, uh, the, it was an, a small industrial factory going on, cleaned it up, found the lovely collections from different places, very small collection. But this is when you have actually entered into someone's home. You know, one artist had said once when he converted his house into a museum, he said, it's my clutter and I've displayed it. So it's a museum. Well, this one is not cluttered because as I walk in here, I'm reminded of this amazing poet 
whose beautiful poetry is sung even today. Dile na da tujhe hua kya hai Aakhir is dard ki dawa kya hai Okay, as you walk through this little gallery, you find these beautiful verses written by this man who just used to put things of life in little verses, this little, little space where he must have had these beautiful evening uh, mushairas or sittings where people came and heard these beautiful lines, which were so close to everyday life and our experiences and said, wah, wah, and that's what happens taking people into these little, quaint little place, the little Haveli, with just a handful of collections, a couple of his clothes, a few of his uh, beautiful notebooks, a couple of his time period pots and pans. I think this is one of the most amazing experience one can have. It's a quiet place, very few visitors, and we love it. The intimacy of this place, in fact, helps uh, as a catalyst to experience a time of the 18th century done with the walls done in the Lakori bricks and the stone which was used during that period. The curators of this museum have done a wonderful, wonderful job of it. Worth seeing, worth visiting. Next, please. The displays don't always have to be in glass cases. Beautiful posters with little images and lovely quotes sometimes make the most legible experience. Next, please. Ah, you know, the first time I understood what uh, street art was when I visited New York uh, years ago. And I was told that when a lot of these kids started doing graffiti, they decided to convert that whole area into a street museum. And that, I said, wow, what a great idea. It was to keep these kids busy. It was to keep these kids getting a sense of confidence um, in what they could do the best, which was basically a lot of graffiti and paint and splashing colors, but also to show a change in the youth, show their way of thinking about their lives and representing it. Now, this might have happened in uh, New York, but I'm so proud to take you onto the next slide when you can see it right here in Delhi. A walk which I have enjoyed, a walk a lot of my guests have enjoyed. They've enjoyed it because you could just walk through and understand these beautiful slices of life in an area which was one of the last of the colonies, which was the housing estate made by the British. Least did the British know that one day the housing society will be converted into one of the most beautiful open air art museums, which you can walk through. And not only walk through, it started off as a beautiful project uh, by an organization called ST Plus Art India Foundation, which means Street Art Foundation. And they decided that they wanted to not only make art representative with a new style called murals, which were right here, with the beautiful popular colors and the pop colors and um, but they also wanted to bring about a kind of an inclusive and a democratic kind of activity can you imagine more than 50 indian and international artists got here to show you different aspects and when i say different aspects right from social issues to feminism to climate change to uh, transgender aspects, to everyday life, to actual portraiture, and to tribal, and wonderful different kind of bizarre abstracted designs. How wonderful is this? And when you walk through this, it seems to be your own place. It seems, you know, you can just stand there and look at it as if you're just walking on the road. And suddenly you realize, what a wonderful experience of a new kind. Now, in India, this is new. No, we had wall paintings in villages. We've seen them in craft museum, wall paintings. But now, the ideology has changed. It is an independent form of expression for young people and their everyday experiences. Today's world, India's today's world is exhibited right there. They even have kids um, on skateboards and jumping with mobile phones to these 
amazingly beautiful calligraphic and typographical displays in bright colors on the walls. You can just sit here with your cup of chai from the market across the road with samosas and just enjoy it and take pictures. And sometimes you might be uh, intrigued by meeting the artist, for instance, this one done by a Polish artist uh, who was influenced by lace. And she creates a whole wall with traditional, um, I mean, you know, the colors, but to create lace from her traditional country. Thanks to Asian Paints for having supported this beautiful project. And I just hope we have many more like this in areas which can get more importance and highlight on our Indian art scene and museum scene. It's poetry on the walls. It's so beautiful and poetry on the walls. And I think that's the best part. So let us take more people to the museum. I think uh, start from home. Maybe once the lockdown is over, take your own family. Now you have many options. And if you go to Old Delhi, of course, a day with Chaat, Kachori, and Ghalib, not a bad idea. Or to Lodi Road and, or anywhere else. And so hopefully there are many more to be covered in the second uh, phase or episode of Museums of Delhi. And I hope you enjoyed this. Thank you. Uh, thank you. Thank you uh, so much, Seema. I mean, uh, we will do a second episode of the Museums of Delhi where we will cover some lesser known yet fascinating museums of Delhi. Seema, in fact, wanted to do an entire episode of all the museums. I said, it's so much of content, we better have to. Uh, now we have a uh, we have uh, time for uh, time for a few uh, questions. Uh, we are now ready for Q and A. If you have a questions, we are ready to take them now. I can answer one without knowing the question is. Yeah. Once the lockdown is over, I'll be more than happy to take all of you, and we can just go for a great walk in one of these places or two or three of them. Wow, oh. amazing. Thank you so much. <laughs> yeah, sure. <laughs> yeah. Uh, Rashmi Gupta is asking, it's a technical question. Uh, thank you, ma'am. Just wanted to know, how do they preserve galleries or place in craft museum as it is open without any roof? Oh, hi, Rashmi. Uh, you know, what is interesting is that uh, it's an ongoing process. You know, we don't ever know about the museum staff. Museum has, uh, in fact, that was one of the big problems in India that we didn't, we were understaffed. We didn't have too many people who could do conservation and preservation. Craft museum, of course, as you've just said very rightly, now look at the rains. A lot of things get washed away. And the minute the rains will get over, they will start work on it again. It's a continuous process of getting people to restore it. And we have now trained conservators and restorers who keep doing these kind of things so that they are well maintained always. Certain things, of course, have got moss on it, but then that adds to the experience. But many a times artifacts have to be. But of course, a protected artifact like the one I showed you of the jackfruit wooden sculpture are in halls because you need to protect things which if they get lost, they will never be able to be replenished. So that's, that's how it is done. Uh, Seema, would you like to talk about the uh, the museum shop in craft uh, craft museum? I mean, that's an amazing place to shop, right? You know, I uh, there are so many things, and I I you know I thought okay, uh, I just talked about crafts that you could carry from the workers, but you know it has been voted as one of the best museum shops in the world. Uh, this is a very interesting ICOM observation which was done in one of the last conferences that 80% of foreigners visiting India said that we haven't seen such a beautiful and uh, absolutely fabulous collection. See, when you visited a place, there's that desperation to take back something which is a reminiscence of that place. So uh, the craft museum is beautifully collect. They've got a great collection. There's a white collection. And you know what I love the most about it? There might be a child who's taken his piggy bank money, which would just be a few tens or twenties or even a hundred. And there would be people who are, of course, carrying their credit cards with no limits. There is something for everybody there. You could buy a small piece of a little terracotta whistle, which costs only 10 rupees. 
and you could take a pashmina shawl which will cost you in thousands so it's again very well thought of and one more thing is that that could be recommended as a great place to shop being a government store and the quality quality consciousness comes a lot especially when we talk about crafts and things and especially when people want to take it back so you're right kuntil i think i would recommend that store any day